Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as George said, the, intention, the original intention was to go and have a look at the trees. So that's why you want to see us polish the presentation as Aaron has given you guys. But um, I just put together a few you know, set of slides to show what the trees look like and what we're trying to do with that work. Um, but before we go into that, just like to say thanks to Sarah and the team for inviting us to be here today. It's good to be sharing the, the research we're doing and also to um, the management of the site for helping us um, keep the site in good shape as well, which is really appreciated. Um, so in terms of the background for this, uh, so I'm with DPI Forestry, as George mentioned, I'm based in Sydney. We've got a network of sites around the state, so this is one of them. Um, and this is part of a broader program of work that DPI has around climate change. Um, so there's a, a DPI climate change research strategy. There's a number of different projects under that, and this is one of them, right? And our, my particular project is looking at uh, ways of maximizing the use of biomass for bioenergy, in particular in New South Wales. And uh, one of the ways we're looking into that is how we can actually maximize production on the land in terms of uh, biomass generation. So we decided to look at the potential for trees to do that, and we decided to look at uh, native trees in particular. Um, and the idea is to look at that for areas of a farm or areas where uh, the land is degraded or where you know, there's um, poor nutrition or marginal areas of land where potentially you know, no other traditional crop can be grown. Um, so it's not about you know, displacing traditional agricultural crops, it's about adding to what's done currently. So that's, that's an important point to be made. And that's why partly we're working with native trees because they integrate really well into the landscape rather than exotic things which may not necessarily fit in. Um, and the other thing with um, biomass crops or short rotation uh, native woody crops is that you know, you've got a bunch of co-benefits that you get from them. So you've got the biomass, but you also have things like uh, potential for soil improvement, provincial soil erosion, uh, things around mitigation and salinity depending on the species you, you work with. Um, and also carbon sequestration, as Aaron's talking about, you know, um, carbon sequestration is one of the ways we can actually achieve emissions reduction. Um, and, um, but also in terms of um, you know, providing a revenue, it's not just planting trees for the sake of planting trees and leaving them there in the landscape, but achieving a carbon sequestration outcome as well as having a productive use for the trees. So that's trying to get the balance between both, right? Um, so the other thing to mention is that, you know, if you're interested in more information around that, and I believe there's um, some printed information in our handouts, uh, but in our website, we've got a heap more information around the work we're doing. If you're interested, go and have a look. Um, that's, where, that's where you go. So just jumping to the actual um, species that we're working with, and you're going to be familiar with a lot of them. Others, maybe not so much. Um, so there's broadly three different categories of trees that we're working with, right? So we're working with... Uh, Firstly, fast growing eucalypts, and that's about working with uh, those more traditional forestry species. Right? So you're obviously familiar with river red gum, that's, um, I believe was recently voted as Australia's favorite tree by the ABC, I think. Um, so that's um, eucalyptus camaldolensis. Um, also cradocalyx, sugar, sugar gum, a very fast growing tree. And also a few other less, um, or, uh, macatheri, which is candem muliba, um, and also spotted gum, which is another very, um, uh, used uh, forestry species in New South Wales. And if we jump into what some of those look like, um, so that's our uh, river red gum plots. Um, if I backtrack a little bit, so our, our trial sites are all about three hectares in size. Uh, in, each, in each trial that we have, we've got about 7,000 trees growing. Um, and for each species that we have, we have about seven or eight replicates, depending on the site and each replica has about 100 trees. So we've got a lot of replication, a lot of um, opportunity there to get some really good information around productivity, carbon sequestration, soil improvement, etc. cetera. Um, and in this particular site here at Tamworth, uh, those trees were planted about two and a half years ago, okay? Um, and those pictures were taken when we came back here back in May, I think, to do the 24 month measurements. So there were two year old trees. Um, and I must say, Tamworth has been one of our star sites in terms of performance. It, the, uh, survival rate has been exceptional, over 95% across all species, uh, and the growth has been really, really good as well. So in terms of uh, river red gum, you know, a lot of the trees on average were over five meters tall already after two, two years, and quite a lot of them have a decent amount of biomass already in the trunk. So remembering that you know, this is all about biomass, it's not about 
the shape of the tree, you know, we, we're not after saw log, we're not after pulp log, it's all about just growing the biomass. So establishment rates are quite high, about two and a half, two and a half thousand stems a hectare. Um, and when, when I say short rotation, it's really three, four years maximum, okay? So it's really maximizing that growth at a very short rate and then housing those trees. And one of the things that we're really interested in is, is trees or species that copies quite well, that can regrow naturally after we harvest them. Because one of the key points is to maximize the maintenance and the costs around you know, management of those, of those crops. And if those trees can coppice and regrow naturally after we, we harvest them, that's, that's a key point, it's a key benefit. Um, so with that in mind, river red gum, uh, that's, that's the, some of the pictures from our side. Moving on to the next one, sugar gum. Um, <coughs> It grows a lot around South Australia. There's a lot of plant, well, plantations. There used to be a plantation up that way. Um, and now it's, um, again, it's a very fast growing species, very good form, um, very consistent with the growth as well. It's up there with river red gum in terms of productivity at this point. Um, Camden woolly butt, um, it's, a, it's a little bit more of a messy looking tree. I mean, it doesn't really matter from a look perspective, but um, it's a less um, traditional forestry species, if you like, but it's still considered to be a fast grower. And you can see here on the side, uh, some of the biomass in the trunk already after two years of growth. So again, you know, that's what we're after. And spotted gum, um, I guess we had a few issues with spotted gum here because it's more suitable to frost. Um, so we had, I think about a year ago, we had a, a pretty serious um, frost event here, which uh, really knocked that uh, particular uh, the spotted gun here. So, uh, but you know, it didn't kill the trees, but uh, it really sort of stunted their growth a little bit. So we had a bit more patchy uh, performance there across the, the spotted gums, compared to, particularly compared to river red gum and the other species, which were not as affected as spotted gum was by by, by the frost. Um, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Just you know, if you have any questions, if you like. Um, so we're also looking at acacias. Um, so, and the reason for that is partly because they're fast growers, as we know, partly because we've got a large uh, range of species to choose from and they're quite adaptable to different areas of, of New South Wales. Um, but also because they have, very importantly, the, you know, the nitrogen fixation row. So they naturally fix nitrogen into the soil. And why that's interesting is that you, know, you could potentially look at it as a way of um, using that tree crop as a way not just of getting a, a crop per se or a biomass crop, but also a way of rege regenerating you know, soil that's actually degraded or poor nutrients already. So if you look at opportunities there to you know, growing fast, fast growing acacias over a few rotation cycles, it may well be that after you know, uh, two or three rotations, the soil, the soil, um, the nitrogen in the soil may be back to a level where it's actually possible to do you whatever it is that you do traditionally for your farm. So it's just trying to think of trees as a tool to manage, you know, rather than just trees for the sake of having trees in the landscape because it's, it's a good thing to do. Um, so that's, that's where we're coming from with that. And one of the things we're doing is we're doing analysis, a regular analysis of soil uh, to understand you know, are those trees really having an impact on, on, on natural nitrogen levels in the soil. And if so, you know, how much you can rely on those. Um, so Acacia deobata, silver wattle, and Acacia salicina, black wattle. Um, so that's the silver wattle there. Um, again, very fast growers, um, doing exceptionally well here on this site. Um, so it's, we're really pleased with how they're going. Black wattle, um, again, doing pretty well. It's a, not as nice looking a tree. It's a, a bit more messy, but um, biomass wise, it's, it's actually doing quite well as well. And then the other uh, group of trees that we're looking at is mallees. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, uh, how they look like. We'll show you in a bit. Uh, but the idea there is that a lot of those trees are traditionally used for carbon sequestration projects around um, Australia. Uh, and one of the reasons is because they are very, very hardy. So they are very low maintenance. So if you put them in, once you get them established, it's really, really hard to get rid of them. <laughs> They're there for, you know, for the foreseeable future. So. Uh, but they're not fast growers, they, are, they take their time. And part of the reason is that they spend a lot of time building their root systems first. Um, and you know, if you think about mallees compared to say river red gum, 50% of the biomass in the mallees is actually in the roots. Whereas with river red gum is about 20 or 15%. So they spend a lot of the energy towards building their root system. And that makes them really resilient, right? But at the expense of their above ground growth. So it's, it's you're never gonna get the same growth that you get with the fast-growing eucalyptus with the, with the mallees. But you do have them 
you know, the establishment costs and maintenance are much, much lower. One of the issues we've had here or across the state is obviously we've had very, two very wet years which coincided with when we've established most of our plots. Um, and the issue around weed management has been particularly difficult with the Mallees because you've got a competition that's happening with, uh, between the weeds and the Mallees because the Mallees are naturally slow growers. So we have to really keep on top of that before otherwise the Mallees are really stunted with their growth. So again, that's something to consider and perhaps not species that you would grow in higher rainfall areas, primarily because of their issue, but you know, particularly in more drier parts of the country, they may be really well suited. Um, and that's where we have um, the species that we're talking about here, Eucalyptus infera. Um, that's a little bit uh, more of an obscure species. Uh, it's called Jurichai Mallee, and that grows, um, it's endemic to Queensland, southern Queensland. Um, so it's naturally, you know, because the thing about Mallee is they are typically more suited to drier areas. That's where they come from. Um, but there are some examples of Mallee's that are they're growing, you know, naturally in higher rainfall areas, and that's one of them. And that's why we're keen to test you know, that particular one across different sites. It has really had very limited research around it. Uh, there is a plantation up in Casino um, with um, uh, one of the growers there who is a tea tree oil uh, producer. Uh, and he's currently trialing that species there for um, oil production as well. Um, so so it, it's growing really well up the Casino way and uh, it's doing really well here as well and across the sites that we have them planted. So, it's, it's, it's showing a lot of promise. And for a mallee, you know, it's growing quite rapidly, uh, so compared to the other mallees that we, that we, that we have. So, so yeah, that's, we're quite pleased with that one. Um, blue mallee, or Eucalyptus polybractea, uh, that is the, if you think about the carbon sequestration projects you see around the landscape, that's what you see normally. That's the blue mallee. And that's endemic to areas like West Wallong. Um, so there's a, a, a farmer in West Wallong who is, uh, who's been producing uh, eucalyptus oil from, from um, uh, Blue Mallee for the last 80 years now, basically. And he manages those on a two year rotation cycle, okay? So, and what he does is that he grows the trees and then he gives them a really heavy haircut, get the, the leaves off and then let them regrow. And he's been doing that with the same parental crop for the last 80 years, so without having to replant. So that shows you how, you know, well those Mallees, uh, they, how well they can coppice, basically. And then the last one of the Mallees, um, Eucalyptus viridus, uh, which is called the Green Mallee. Um, again, more sort of common in WA in parts of Queensland. Um, it's really quite well adapted to the dry areas as well. Um, and it's probably one of the slowest growers, but where it is growing well, it's really well established. So it's one of those I think that will take a while to really take off, but when they do, they're gonna be quite a, a consistent performer. Um, so it's, it's just, you know, the whole idea here is it's, it's not a commercial trial, it's a research trial. So it's about understanding what would do well in different areas of the state. And then once we have uh, that part of the work finished, then that's where we're gonna tailor the next sort of steps towards, you know, okay, if we've got the two or three, you know, picks from the species that we're working with, what are the optimum spacing and requirements? You know, can we grow, uh, you know, native grasses in the interrows between the trees? And how can we actually maximize the production um, once we select the trees that, or the species that are most suited to different sites. And I guess the other thing I should mention that when Aaron was talking about markets as well, I mean, there's a huge, we anticipate there will be a huge demand for biomass that's gonna grow quite rapidly. Um, and one of the drivers for that is, you know, the whole carbon industry, uh, the fact that uh, we need a lot of industries to decarbonize. Um, and, you know, I've had a lot of discussions with power stations um, around here. So at Cape Byron Power Station, they are very, very keen to plant extensive areas of biomass crops to supply the, the power station. And also talking currently to a power station at the Hunter Valley, and they um, would require close to a million tons of biomass a year to operate, right? So that interest is only gonna grow. So biomass is gonna become more and more of a valuable commodity. And things like um, aviation fuel is another. We haven't looked at the logistics side of things just yet because they're just research trials. So, but uh, we imagine that it would depend on the species. If we're talking about the you know, more traditional forestry species, the single stem species, that's gonna be more like your thinning type machinery for forestry. Um, but if you're talking about the multi-stemmed 
trees, then uh, I don't know if you're familiar, there's a Mali harvester that's been developed, which is a single pass machine that then sort of has a truck that goes along and sort of collects the biomass. So you would chip it? Yeah, wood chip it. Basically, you know, cut the whole tree and wood chip it on site. So, what, what, is, the, what is the carbon offset then when you actually take it away? The well, what, what's the yeah, no, so that's a good question because under the emissions reduction fund, we've got a plantation forestry method. And the way it works is it allows for the harvest to happen. So what it credits is the average sequestration over time. So if you've got the cycles of cutting and regrowth, if you imagine there will be trees in different stages of, of growth, then what it credits is the average carbon sequestration over time. Even though you're harvesting it, there's still, you know, not just the above ground, but the root system as well will be counted. So, yeah. So when you burn it, who actually pays for the, for the pollution of the carbon? Well, the thing is, it's, it's considered to be a renewable cycle, so that's the difference between coal and biomass, right? Be correct, pretty much, because then what you're going to be growing out there is going to be offsetting what's going to be emitted, so, yeah. But you can't get your climate carbon trees for the same? No, no, it's a different, it will be a different mechanism, so... You wouldn't do it on a plantation forestry? You, you do, well, in a plantation forestry project, you, you have... What you're accredited for is the average carbon in the forest plus the average carbon in the wood product that's produced. So you could have a similar sort of exercise, you know, from a, for this perspective, if there was a mechanism to sort of uh, award credits for that bioenergy, you know, benefit that you're getting. But we don't have a mechanism for that. But um, the renewable, renewable energy target, for instance, that's one of the areas where you could get credit for the biomass separately from the forest, right? So it's what happens to the biomass after it leaves the forest, which is counted for separately. Yeah. So, yeah. It gets a little bit complicated because you've got different mechanisms for yeah. realizing the benefit. Yeah.